Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to talk about one of my favorite locations in Brooklyn to see performances of all sorts of theatric variety, and that is BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Um, as always, I've prepared some lecture notes for today to give you an idea as to what we're going to be covering and to remind you of a couple of key terms and figures that we'll be discussing for today. Um, but uh, the focus is going to be on the, the programming that has happened as a part of their uh, next wave festival. So um, for the first part of lecture, we'll talk about the history of BAM, um, the building itself, uh, the facilities that are there, um, in addition to uh, outlining the um, major festival that happens on a yearly basis, uh, the Next Wave Festival. And in parts two, three, and four, uh, we'll discuss two artists um, chronologically that have presented important works at um, BAM's Next Wave Festival. So without further ado, let me go ahead and pull up my lecture notes. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the borough of Brooklyn, um, maybe you live in Manhattan or Queens or haven't spent a lot of time in one of the uh, you know, larger sectors of New York City, um, uh, you know, the Brooklyn Academy of Music or otherwise known as BAM is a major cultural institution that represents a number of cutting edge artists um, and represent some fairly avant-garde programming. So um, we're going to deal with the, uh, the upper left-hand side of uh, my lecture notes for right now. Um, the history of the performance venue, um, well, just to let you know where it is currently, um, hopefully you have all seen it, um, passing through Atlantic Terminal, um, BAM has a number of buildings um, that are located in that main central area, um, but that's not the, um, the only location that BAM has had. It's, um, it's been there though um, since after the um, initial fire of the building. So um, the original location, uh, BAM has been a cultural institution since 1861. Um, and the original location was at Montague Street uh, in, Brooklyn uh, in Brooklyn Heights. Um, the largest theater that was there sat 2,000 people, and there was a smaller concert hall, a chorus room, and rehearsal facilities. Unfortunately, like I said, that building ended up burning down in 1903. Um, and then in 1908, the building um, it was in its, its current location, um, near Atlantic Terminal, as I uh, said earlier. Um, and interestingly enough, from 1908 to 1921, shared programming with um, the Metropolitan Opera, meaning that the Met Opera used the Brooklyn Academy of Music as a venue for some of their presentations for their concert programming up until 1921. So just to give you an idea of the amount of prestige this um, location has had and the sort of longstanding history. Uh, to the left, I have the, um, uh, the spaces that are um, contained within the Brooklyn Academy of Music. The largest hall is the uh, Opera House. It seats over 2000 people. Um, next up is the Harvey Theater. Uh, it seats just under 900 people. Um, we also have uh, two other smaller spaces, one of which is a black box, which is a very inviting 250 um, occupancy. Um, and uh, that's really inviting for uh, lesser known artists to perhaps present uh, new works at a high profile venue without um, having to draw an audience of 2,000 individuals. Um, 
there's also this this space that I have listed here um, is a part of um, the, the the sort of larger entry way of of the um, of one of the, the the larger spaces. I'm fairly certain it's the opera hall. Um, but in any case, there are jazz um, uh, sort of more popular music oriented um, uh, presentations at this space that um, also has like a cafe. So it's um, again, many, many different spaces with ha which have different styles of um, seating arrangements and um, occupancies uh, and, and audience capacities in order to invite um, maximum diversity of programming. So this is a very, very cool thing to, to see. It's not just like a list of, of, of facts here. It's trying to show you that, um, that the, the space has probably withstood the test of time because of its, um, its flexibility. Um, in terms of presentation. So like I said, there, um, the, the, the space, the high amount of prestige has, of course, in its long standing history, sort of ebbed and flowed in terms of um, its popularity. And, um, you know, due to other economic factors outside of, you know, of, that, that put pressures on on performance venues because you know thinking like wartime for example uh, arts and um, education uh, end up getting on the chopping block in terms of um, receiving support so that you know within the last hundred years there have certainly been um, peaks and valleys in terms of um, venues uh, having their their sort of heyday and low points um, but in the 1960s, there was a major turnaround for the venue. So prior to 1960, it was kind of at a little bit of a low point um, after its initial popularity, um, especially when the Met was doing stuff there into 1921. Um, again, 1921 to 1950, World War I, World War II should be like the sort of big, big things that are, that are on your mind in terms of global issues that are going to impact government spending and, uh, you know, the arts in general, it, everything is very interconnected. In any case, um, there was a turnaround in the 60s. And um, in the 80s, you know, two decades later, after we had, you know, after they had, had come up with a good amount of funding, um, much more support than they had previous, uh, the um, president at that time decided to create what was called the Next Wave Festival. And it has been in year, um, yearly showings since 1981. And the reason that we're going to pay attention to it is because um, it, it has been the place in which um, many important works that have gone on to very important venues have been presented and showcased there initially. Um, work uh, not workshopped, but um, uh, you know, initial presentations of of the world premieres, and um, some big names have 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 had their their big starts through the Next Wave Festival. Um, we're going to talk about Philip Glass. He certainly had um, a number of important connections pre Next Wave Festival. We're also going to talk about Lori Anderson. Um, very, very interesting artist who crosses the genres of popular music, theater, and you know, um, more uh, avant-garde musical styles. We're gonna talk about some lesser known things, which is always really fun, pieces that have been forgotten. Uh, I'm gonna take a chance to plug my, um, one of my previous schools, the California Institute of the Arts, uh, with one of their productions that they did. Meredith Monk. I hope that some of these names are familiar to you. If not, um, I'm going to get to show you some, um, at least one piece that is from their portfolio that um, was again presented at the Next Wave Festival. As a way of kind of closing off our first section, BAM recently, somewhat recently in the last you know, two decades, I think it was a little over 10 years ago, um, 
celebrated its 150th anniversary. And as a result, what ended up happening was um, uh, BAM put together a celebrating at 150 video um, uh, cinema project that showcases a number of their important um, projects uh, throughout the history of the institution. Um, so I want to play two clips from that film. Um, and then we're going to take a look at some of their wonderful archives. They have a lot of uh, especially photographs that are digitized from the early performances in the 80s, which is rarely where we're going to be uh, focusing our, our, um, our area of study today. So without further ado, um, I want to play our first video clip, which talks about a little bit more about the history of the venue itself. Um, and then uh, the last clip is um, a number of important artists through different mediums that are talking about the importance of that, of the venue. So I will pull up the first video right now, hold on. If London builds the Crystal Palace in 1851, well, New York builds its Crystal Palace in 1853. Paris does the Bois de Boulogne in 1852. New York is going to do Central Park in 1857. So from this perspective, that New York City builds the New York Academy of Music in 1854, we are not totally surprised that the elites in Brooklyn, in competition with New York, are showing that they too have the capacity to jump in. A bunch of these uh, city fathers at the time got together and said, OK, we have to stop boasting about how big we are, and we have to start making Brooklyn into a true world capital or metropolis. The people that lived in Brooklyn Heights at the time, who were sort of these captains of industry, the Lowe's, the Pierponts, wanted their own cultural venue. So that the new aristocracy could come together and celebrate the arts, show off their dresses, show off their marriageable daughters, and in general bask in their advantageous social status. And that's going to be a pretty consistent theme when we are looking at different <laughs> uh, venues, especially ones that have uh, been around for 100 and 150 years. Um, we're going to talk about um, the Met Opera, um, you know, Carnegie Hall as well. Um, and all of these are a way of showcasing a big money to showcase um, culture as a, as just as, um, you know, the, the, the wealthy collect, collect art, um, they, they also um, had a long withstanding relationship with um, uh, funding cultural institutions as a way of um, boasting about their superiority. And uh, if you have any question as to that, I mean, you just need to look at the um, beginnings of any of the major um, uh, foundations or museums, for example, the Met Museum, um, and where where its initial start came from, the Natural History Museum, just to name two, uh, and not to get us too off topic. In any case, um, not talking, so that was the initial impetus for creating the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Um, it was about showcasing uh, culture as a way of flaunting status. And um, it's since then, obviously, there have been a number of changes to, to, to the venue. It also burned down, and there were major, um, um, obviously, setbacks because of the, the building's um, un, untimely demo, demolition. Um, but it, it also you know, took a new direction based on its new location. And different presidents have had different agendas with the, um, with BAM and pushing it in particular directions. Um, again, the president who uh, took over in the 1960s made dramatic changes to BAM to push it in a direction that was more avant-garde, more experimental, more cutting edge. Um, 
And the next wave festival was a way of showcasing that. Um, just to talk about, you know, less about the logistics and where maybe things have come from. Um, we're again talking about art and um, mostly focusing on, on music and, and performance. Uh, BAM is very specifically, maybe not just a music venue, but um, the, the music that we're gonna be listening to has a strong connection with theater. And um, I myself am very interested in interdisciplinary art because I think that uh, we're very visual individuals and that we have a strong connection to visual components when we're, uh, you know, um, inter interacting with art and that music can be, the experience of music can be deepened when you um, were more thoughtful or more direct or perhaps indirect, whatever you want as an artist, but it is, it is certainly different um, when you can attach a visual medium to it as well. And um, the Next Wave Festival, again, because it has an avant-garde approach to it, we're going to be dealing with music and its relationship to theater. So um, again, as a part of BAM's 150th anniversary, um, they put together uh, a really moving um, assembly of artists who have presented at BAM to talk about um, what theater is, what it means, and perhaps why it's going to withstand the test of time. So that's going to close out our first section. Let me go ahead and cue it up. <laughs> I think live performance is something that's so important and, and very touching. And I think that it's a place that people can be very, very open-hearted and, and can really take something that might change their ways of seeing or hearing something from that point on. And it's human and, and I believe a human need to be told stories. It's how we make sense of ourselves. It's how we figure out who we are or how we've changed. The theatre only exists in the present. Sometimes you can have bring things from the past, but only if you can genuinely find the life in the present for them. When you perform, every night the audience is different. Sometimes you perform a piece that you think is comical, but people laugh differently or in different places, or they don't laugh at all. So there is a life of its own in that big room. What I like is this sort of gathering together of people. Yeah, you know, you're in the room all together doing the same thing, basically. You're all, you know, trying to make something happen together. The audience is, is working just as hard as the performers, I feel. How often in your life do you see people who aren't your lover or, you know, your brother or someone you know so well really putting themselves out there with a total possibility of failing? I think that's really amazing. People want to go to some place where they, they can just hear it in a physical way, not some kind of you know thing in their in their really lousy headphones, but really be blown away by the spectacle, by the sound that comes into your body, just invades you, can't help it. One of the concerts is over. People will come up and they'll say, "Gee, you know, I heard music for 18 musicians on a record. I really love that, but gosh, it's so much better to hear it live." Why people respond that way? Uh, why why do we smile at each other? You know, why do we sexually attracted to uh, various people? <laughs> Don't ask me, man. That's the way it is. <laughs> so obviously, that clip makes me really miss performing in front of a live audience myself. Um, for those of you who have not had this kind of connective interaction with art, I so encourage you that when things, when you're comfortable, when things start to open up, when you see something that might uh, interest you to, even if it's something that you've, you're already familiar with, you know, seeing a production of Hamlet. Yeah, I know you probably read it as a senior in high school, for example. Um, seeing it on stage is a completely different experience. 
um, and cannot um, invite you more warmly to um, to do the thing that um, all of these and these all of these people are artists that we're going to be talking about today. We saw Lori Anderson, um, Meredith Monk. I don't know if we're going to talk about Steve Reich, but we did st see Steve Reich as well. Um, all of these uh, these these figures um, are, are very much aware of the importance and um, potent characteristics, whatever they might be, things that stick to you, um, that, that live performance has a kind of thrill to it that a recording simply doesn't. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think that the Next Wave Festival Pick, you know, showcased really important artists that resonated with their audience members. And um, one thing that I do talk about in my in my other classes um, that I haven't talked about here is that there's there's a kind of triangular relationship that happens in um, in a piece of theater or a performance. And that is an ongoing relationship between the audience, the performers, and the artwork itself. And when you have a recording, you are taking out some of that relationship. And it's not, there is a, a kind of energy and thrill to the room that is something that you can't really capture um, in a recording. So in any case, uh, parts two, three, and four, we're going to talk about important things that have happened at the Next Wave Festival. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, start our conversation talking about an opera um, by Philip Glass. So I will see you for part two shortly.